came out of uh, Father Wise and all that. And Brandon told me, she said, I just want to be Todd White. You know, that guy with the dreadlocks that went and ministered to everybody. Yeah. You already yeah. knew. Yeah. I mean, you just did that. So yeah. you should be glad. All right, y'all ready this morning? Yeah. Let's open our Bibles together. The time of day is the bride. And um, <laughs> I love that picture. I'm sorry, my eyes done. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story this morning. I'm going somewhere with it. I want you to try to stay with me. And, and uh, Genesis 1, 26, when, when we find the creation story, so then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion. So when God made man, he made him to look like him. He made him to be like him. In other words, who do you think Adam looked like? He looked like Jesus. Yep. If you stood them up next to each other, they probably were identical, Okay. And, but that's here or there. Next page. The next verse says, So then God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. Now, I don't want to get into an anatomical uh, you know, debate with you about this. I'm just trying to tell you that when God made man, he made every man that would ever be was in Adam. Amen. So he made him male and female. In other words, that Adam could have uh, procreated by himself. Now, I don't want to get somebody's eyebrows to you know, get a cramp on that one, but I'm just trying to tell you that, that then he brought all the animals by Adam, and he named them all, and he couldn't find it because he was lonely. See, we went to, like I said, we, show, we watched that show called Alone, and the guy, one guy built a cabin, and had a, he built a stone fireplace. He had got plenty of food, but he tapped out because he was alone. Because it wasn't the physical things that drove him out. He couldn't stand being by himself. And so God saw that man, well, his man was lonely, even though he was self-sufficient in and of himself. So he caused this great sleep to come upon him. And when Adam took that nap, boy, he, and when he woke up from that one, everything was different. Wow. Next page. Wow. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Amen. Now I'm gonna make a point here before he said that when he created man, he blessed him and said, "Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion." Why would he have to subdue or have dominion? There wasn't even a devil yet. Because I got news for you that this kingdom that's been given to you has been given to you, but you've got to go subdue it and conquer it. Right? So anyway, back to the nap. Next page. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The word rib, next page. The word rib in the King James, the Hebrew word literally means side. So what God did was is he took his complete man, when he put him to sleep, he removed from him the female side and then made another being and put it next to him. Yet when God would talk to them, that he would call them both by one name. He would call them both Adam. Because even though he had taken the female side and put it next to him, they were still considered to be one person in the eyes of God. And then Adam looked at this fine creature next to him and said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman or man with a womb because she was taken out of man. Watch this. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Next page. Well, here's the thing I want you to understand. Go on next page. Adam declared that she was now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, that a man shall leave his mother and father. Mother and father? Adam don't have a mother and a father. He don't even have a belly button. What does he know about, right? He's prophesying something here. And I want you to say the word cleave is the part I want you to get a hold of. Now stay with me. Next page. Cleave means when, watch this, when two different materials violently collide, producing a single new material. That's what it means to cleave. The idea that we have in America about marriage is uh, like trying on shoes. Yep. Oh my. I got loose for it. If it was as hard to get married as it used to be, and as permanent as it used to be, 
they would last longer. But that's not what the sermon's about today. In other words, when God marries you, he doesn't just give you a legal document. He takes two people and violently collides them together, making one person out of two. Marriage is not a 50-50 uh, proposition. It's a 100-100. It'd be 110, but it's not possible to give 110. Hang in there, Lou. I'm, yeah, I'm sitting with the cleats. Like, next question. <laughs> Now, here's where I'm going with this thing. Hang with me. In other words, this was God's idea of what he called marriage. Even though there were two people standing there, he would call them both Adam. When sin was interjected into this, then he gave the woman a name because something had come between them and separated the union. Are you still with me? Yeah. Ephesians 5, 28 through 32. It says, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. That sound familiar to you? For this reason, a man shall cl uh, leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Watch this. This is a great mystery I speak concerning Christ and the church. What God did with Adam was a foreshadowing of something that was coming later. That it wasn't just for us on the earth, but he was planning something, demonstrating something so much greater that was coming. He was talking about, I'm not talking about man and woman. I'm talking about my church or the bride and the bridegroom. Yeah, yeah. Everybody with me now? Come on. Y'all yeah, yeah. sitting way far in the back. I got to spit a lot. I'm not a spitter much. Hang on just a second. Next paper. Well, in Philippians 2, this is where this thing is coming from. He said, let this mind be in you. Now, if you've got an NIV Bible, this is mistranslation. And probably some other ones. I looked this up in the Greek because I want to get it right. He said, let. What does the word let mean? It means you've got to give permission to. That means it's, it's, it's just as possible for you to think some other kind of way. Now, here's what I'm talking this morning. Listen, you know what this church is for? This is a, this is a place, this is a launching pad. This is a place where people want to go deeper. If you're here this morning and you're just trying to check off your little go to church thing and, and get that off your list so you, you don't have to worry about your conscience bothering you, or you're, you're trying to join some a little, little social club, this is not where you need to be. When you come here, you're saying, I want to go further, higher, and deeper. I want to find out what my purpose in God is. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the same power and volition that Jesus had. That's who I'm talking to this morning. And he's saying to us, and Paul was writing to the church at Philippi, let this mind, let this type of thinking be in you. That was in Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Watch this. Who being in the form of God, who did God make us in the image of, right? right. Yes. Did not consider robbery or cheating to be, oh, come on. Come on man. Equal come on. with God. Did I say you were God? No. Lord, go look in the mirror. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I'm going to tell you what Jesus is saying about you this morning. He's saying you're equal with me. Wow. If you'll embrace this, I already paid the price. I already set it up. You can't earn it. You can't do it. But I made this to where you can now walk with me. In other words, I've made you into Adam again. I've made you another creation that wasn't here when the ark landed. You're not a human. You're not, you don't belong to the hue, to the earth. You're a kingdom man. You don't belong here. You belong there. When you, when you walk in the spirit, you look just like Jesus. And until you identify yourself, the devil can't tell the difference. Oh, y'all can get that. Let this mind be in you that was in Jesus, who in the form, was in the form of God, did not think he was cheating by saying the words, I am equal with God. How many of you stand up in front of the mirror and say, I am equal with God? Boy, I bet if you started your day off like that, things wouldn't affect you like it does now. Next page. Now watch this. Therefore, how you get the therefore? Can you, you got to see what the therefore is there for. In other words, if you don't fulfill the first part of this, you're not qualified for the next part. 
If you don't think it's, if you have come to the place where you've just decided, I'm going to quit sinning and falling around and farting around like everybody else. I'm going to live a life that gives honor to God. Yeah. I'm not going to see how close to hell I can get and still make it to heaven. Yeah. I'm not going to see how much sin I can still live with and, and, and go to church on Sunday without it bothering me. I've decided to lay my life down before him and say, you're going to live through me and in me. And just like Brianna said, I want to go and I want to make I want to make a difference in the lives of the people that I impact. Yeah. Because I got news for you, Brianna. If you can feel the devil when you walk on that street, the devil can feel you. Yeah, that's right. Woo! That's, right. that's, right. that's what I want. I want to walk in the room and the climate change. Yes. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. Now watch this just for a second. Next page. See, I met this woman 34 years ago. And one day I bowed on my knee and I stuck a ring up to her and she agreed to be my wife. At the time, she was this Irish woman named Sherry O'Reilly. But buddy, when we stood before God and I made a covenant to her, I, I'll tell you something, God took two people and violently collided them into the middle. And you know what happened at that point? I not only became one with her, guess what, click that thing for me. I gave her my name. Amen. See, that's what it means when you're married. I'm giving you my name. And when I am one with Christ Jesus, he has given me a name that's above every other name. I am now bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. When I say in the name of Jesus, she, she doesn't have to call me every day and say, she don't care if I do this. She said, don't care if I can use that stuff. Because you know, whatever belongs to me belongs to her. She didn't ask permission to walk through her own house. She didn't ask permission to drive her own car. She didn't have to walk around trying to feel unworthy. It's hers because it's got my name on it. You nailed it. That's good. And when you decide to get serious about this thing and realize I've been given a name that's above every other name because I'm in a marriage relationship with the God of this universe. But you know what that means? That means he has jammed us together to where you can't find where Jesus is and I start. Amen. And I'm not doing this thing because I'm pretending to do it. I know who I am and who I am and who I believe and what I'm going to do. Yes. 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 Next page. That's why I can read this scripture and say love has been perfected in 1 John. Mm -hmm. And we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because I hope I can do enough good things and get enough gold stars. No, because I had a violent collision one day with my Savior. And when I got up from that nap, I wasn't the same. Because there wasn't just as much him as it was me. Because as he is, so are we in this yes. world. Yes. Is everybody listening to me? Yes. I see a lot of whispering and snickering and stuff. That bothers me a little bit. This is life saving and life changing this morning. If you'll decide to quit letting the world change you and you become a world changer. As he is, so are we in this world. How is Jesus this morning? Where is Jesus this morning? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. How's he doing? Is he depressed? No. Is he sick? No. Is he injured? No. Is he worried? No. no. You know why? Because he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Because he's been given, given all power and authority that whatever's under his feet should be taking dominion over the place they're living and not letting it rule them, but ruling over it. Yes. Next page. We're almost done. See, here's some of you don't get this. So we were talking about this on, on the stage this morning about how that, that experience that, that Pastor Cameron gave to his son, giving him that blessing, putting that ring on his finger. I didn't get that until right before my dad died. And I just asked him, I said, do you love me? And he said, oh. And, and of course, he'd been, you know, I, I told him, let me tell you this story real quickly. I, I was 37 years old. I remember it just like it's yesterday. And, and I'd been at my dad's house, and we'd gotten in a big fight over nothing, as so we always did. If you've heard it, just pretend you haven't. And I'm driving home, I'm crying, upset, and, and just because it just always goes this way. Yeah. And I said, and, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, he said, all you want is for your dad to love you just the way you are, not the way you, he wishes you were. 
I said, yeah. He said, but you're not willing to love him that way. Mm -hmm. I said, well, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I realized that was wrong. Wow. I wanted him to love me the way I was. And so because he wasn't the way I wanted him to be, wow. I was always upset with him. So I went on a decade-long journey to, to, to crawl out from under being little Charlie, the son, to being Charlie, the minister, for my own dad. Yeah. I went up to him, and I hugged his neck, and it's about like this pole. Oh. And I tell him I love him, and he just kind of patted him on the shoulder. Ten years of that. But by the end, he was leaning in, oh. hugging me back. Tell me he loved me back. I was breaking him down just a little at a time. Having two girls just really messed him up. <laughs> and by the end of his life, the last week he lived, he talk, probably told me 50 times that he loved me without any instigation on my part. But that blessing, that feeling of affirmation, everybody has to have it. And if you don't get it from your parents, You've got to get it from God. In fact, you're supposed to get it from God anyway. And so here's what I want you to know about you in case you didn't know. If you're having a bad day, read, read Romans chapter 8. Yes. He said, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. Now, hold on. Can you go forward one scripture, one slide, and I'll come back. I want to talk, go again to the picture. I want to talk to you about predestination. I believe in predestination. In the sense that I know that the American Airlines Flight 1407 is predestined to leave Atlanta and land in, in Los Angeles. And if you want to go to Los Angeles, all you got to do is get on the plane. Yeah. You are predestined to go to heaven. Everybody's predestined. But if you don't get on the plane, you're not going nowhere. Yeah. So that's what predestination is. Is that he's already foreordained some things about you that if you just get on the plane, they'll be true about you. And if you don't want to get on the plane, don't blame somebody else because your life sucks. Let's go back there. Well, he'll be predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He don't want you to be some sinner saved by grace. So he don't want you to be the bottom hanging on by your fingernail. He's already made your place for you at the king's table. To be conformed to the image of his son, that you might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, he predestined these, he also called them. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Wait a minute. I thought he said he wouldn't give his glory to another. That's right, because you're not another. You're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You're married in a relationship with him to where two have been fused into one, where you can't find where one stops and the other begins. You're just as much Jesus as Jesus is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Oh. I don't know if anybody getting that today. See, he wouldn't get with you before you even knew who you were. He went ahead and predestined for you to be his son, seated at the table with his other son. That he had already, while he's at it, he went ahead and called you, and he went ahead and justified you, and he went ahead and glorified you. And all this is true about you, waiting on you to answer his invitation to join him at the table. Yeah, yeah. Next page. Yeah, that's good, Pastor. Yeah. Amen. That's why he said at the end of this, he said, what? He said I am persuaded that neither death nor life no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, nor bad economy or stock market crash or diphtheria or the plague or nothing else or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if we'd ever get a hold of this concept and what this relationship means, that this would be the, the driving force in our life, that we could graduate from planet white trash and get on the track where we can live in the palace. But until we go there, we're not ever going to get out of this route, this little, this little rut we're digging, going round and round the mountain. And I want to give you an invitation this morning for some people to get out of that rut, to get out of that, that continuous generational curse and come to a place to where everybody in my family had this wrong with them, but it ain't going to affect me. Everybody in my family was always in debt and poor and been sick and impoverished and depressed. And, all this stuff. and I'm ready to get off that train. I'm ready to get on the plane that's going to land in the kingdom where I've been predestined to be a success. I've already been given a ring and a name. 
us above every other name. If that's who I really am, would you stand with me this morning?